Good evening, and welcome to On the Other Hand. This is kind of an exciting night for me. Um, I've got a young lady here. I say young because you see with this gray hair, anybody under 50 is young to me, as you people know. And so this is going to be fun because we're going to talk about the state of the state. And I learned so much in the last couple of days online reading about the state of the state that um, we're going to get some answers tonight, I hope. And if not, she's going to go back and say, well, spent the afternoon or the evening with uh, an old broad and she asked me some questions and I need these answers. So we're going to start right now. I'm going to introduce my guest. It's Melissa Zebrin. Pretty close. Pretty close. Okay. <laughs> what is it? It's pronounced Zebrin. Zebrin. That's correct. Okay. But I, that's okay. I, it's no, okay? No, no I, I'll answer to almost anything. Oh, well, that's good because Murdy, I, yeah. growing up, I've answered to some things I won't admit to now, okay? <laughs> it rhymes with too many things. But anyway, it's fun. Yeah. It's fun. So I really want to thank you for being here well, thank tonight. thank you for having this me. This is going to be just two friends talking, yes. no gotcha. Yeah. I don't do gotcha. Yeah, okay. no, I'm happy. I, I'm pretty but, transparent. But I think that this is going to be really good because people sitting out there in the audience probably have a lot of questions mm -hmm. that you don't get off of a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, before I start, I have to tell you that I did do a little, you know, investigating of good. you. I'm glad. Okay. And I'm not saying your name again. I'm just going to call you <laughs> Melissa from Please now do. on. Okay. And you grew up in East Hampton? Yeah, I grew up in East Hampton until I was about uh, 14, and then I moved to East Haddam. Um, so that's why the district that I currently represent is so special to me, because my childhood friends are in East Hampton, my high school friends are in East Haddam, and I'm very fortunate to represent them. Wow, that's really, really great. And I see you, um, and this really, I spent time on the uh, Connecticut State University System mm -hmm. Board, and I see you graduated from Central Connecticut State University. I wish I could say I graduated. But you I, went to I, it. I attended Central. I started at Middlesex Community College, uh -huh. uh, like so many others. Um, and then I went to Central, but unfortunately I didn't finish my degree. Something my mother continues to harp on me about, by the way. I understand that. <laughs> I, have, I have one just like you. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm passing on that, okay? All right, so. Uh, let's see, you have had numerous positions in public service. You've been president of the Gillette Castle State Park in East Haddam, mm -hmm. economic development coordinator and a member of the Middlesex Chamber Revitalization Commission. Yeah. Okay, board of education member. Yeah, that's how it started for me, like so many others uh, like in that. public service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you've been a member of the Finance Policy and Open Space Committee. Am I, did I? In, did? in East Haddam, I was okay. a member of the Elderly Tax Relief, Elderly and Disabled Tax Relief Committee, uh, among some others. But in the Capital, I serve on the Appropriations Committee, not on the Finance Committee. I would never serve on the Appropriations <laughs> Committee. It's not an easy job. Me? I'm, uh, not an easy me, job. Uh, that's not for me. Okay, so you were elected to an open seat for the 34th District in mm -hmm. the Connecticut House of Representatives in 2012. Yeah, Am I correct? That's right. And, and I ran. I ran against a, a, a childhood friend, actually, and it was. Uh, Are you still friends? Yes. <laughs> that's yes. great. Okay. Well, unlike the campaign I'm in now, it was a very uh, positive Used and. To be. Um, um, campaign in 2012. Um, you know, we never uh, talked ill of each other or sent or mailings. Attacked. No, yes, no, no, right, no. Very right. respectful. I, I really, I really got a kick out of this because I got this out of WikiLeaks or whatever that oh. thing is, right? <laughs> and then it says um, that you were going to seek election as the you're going to go now to the Senate, the Connecticut Senate. Am I correct? Yes, I hope okay. to serve, and that's an additional nine towns uh, yeah. more than I serve now. So it's a 12 town district. Wow, that's yeah, it's great. A big I, I think it's delightful. But anyway, okay. And you're married to your husband Scott. Yeah, we'll be married 25 years pretty soon. God bless I you. Know. That is wonderful. Yes. That's terrific. Yeah. 
and you haven't killed him. No, he's he's well, he's, and we've built two houses together. So oh, I've 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 been through the fire for well, sure. If anybody has built a house um, with a husband, and I mean built it, I don't mean hire a contractor. I mean you built it. Yeah, in fact, we just uh, we had a small little addition we're putting on, and we uh, had somebody come in and spray the foundation. You know, with that black tar. Right, right. And I said to my husband, "Remember when I put on <laughs> that suit and I did it myself with a paintbrush? Oh. Um, if I had known I could hire." somebody I might have gone a that, different that, course that, yeah, that, mm. well my husband before I lost him and I were married 48 years wow, and he was delightful wonderful. and he was easy going and he was you know and still once a month I wanted to kill him and I couldn't <laughs> think of anything painful enough but now I miss him so much I you bet, know it's really he was a best guy he yeah, really was yeah and then this is what tickled me and it uh -oh. says you have two children yes I do yeah, boys. a boy and a girl my daughter Brittany's 23 and my son Brian is 19 and the last line of this was she is also an owner of hound dogs. <laughs> I believe it's right there. See, it's yeah, right there. Duke and Daisy. Actually, Duke and Daisy are featured in a video that uh, we just taped last week. <laughs> and right? my dogs are 13 years old now. No wonder so. they put them in your biography. But when <laughs> They've I been around that, a long time. When I saw that, I went, I think that's the only one I ever read that it had the dogs mentioned as part of the family. Yeah, you know? yeah. That kind of got a kick out of it. Well, that, they are know? a big part of our family. Isn't that so, not, yeah, you get yeah. so attached to Absolutely. them. Absolutely. Oh, I know that feeling, you know. So, you really want to do this. Yeah, you know what's interesting is when um, I first announced that I was running for office, I actually originally announced that I was going to stay and seek re-election for state representative. Um, and uh, you mentioned my original race in 2012. Uh, I beat my childhood friend, my opponent, by almost 10 points in the following year. I beat my opponent by 70% to 30% of the vote, and then in 16, I was unopposed. So when I initially uh, sought re-election as state rep, I went to bed and the next morning woke up with a lot of regret, and here's why. Because the uh, having a tie in the state senate the last two years has provided an opportunity to really start looking at fiscally responsible policies on behalf of taxpayers. And when thinking about the state Senate race and uh, stepping out of what will be and certainly has proven to be a very difficult race, I felt like I was letting um, not just myself down by not getting up to the challenge, but also the residents of this state. Having that tie in the Senate, or more importantly, even the possibility of having a majority in the Senate, will really provide uh, a surety of fiscal responsibility in the state. And so at that point, I called up several people, uh, including finding someone who would be interested in running for state rep, um, and made the switch to run for state Senate. Uh, it's not an easy job, obviously, especially in this kind of partisan um, divide we have right now. An attack mode. Yeah. I have never seen anything it's as nasty as, as a matter of fact, as I did my homework on you, I recognize and realize that you've been attacked and I was very, I'm going to say, being an old broad, I was, in, I was embarrassed for you that you had to be attacked. Um, I thought this is not the way when I was young mm. we grew up. I mean, my husband, Stan, ran for office three times, got elected four times, really lost once, won three times. Mm -hmm. And I ran once, but it wasn't the way it is now with such I, I, the troll. I, I just can't yeah. believe it. Yeah. I, in fact, on my way here this morning, I had a friend, a Democrat um, friend, call me this morning. Uh, he had gotten yet another mailer uh, that is negative in nature against me. And it's interesting because the people who know me um, are getting very upset by it. Well, um, that's exactly So true. you wonder about the other folks who don't know me, but here's the thing. Uh, no one's going to outwork me. Uh, I have, our campaign has knocked on over 10,000 doors in this district and uh, we're talking to a lot of people with about the serious concerns which is the fiscal state of Connecticut and the lack of sustainability which is really driving down a low confidence by our business community which is just perpetuating our uh, revenue decline and everything else so you have to have a strong backbone and I can tell you my skin will probably be crocodile grade 
<laughs> by November 7th. I have um, some good moisturizer. Yeah, well, call perfect. <laughs> I'm going to call you. Listen, um, it's not easy being a tough woman. No. We get called a lot of things. Yeah, very um, nasty. I and was really if, shocked. If men uh, were in our positions, they would be called strong and assertive. Right. But when you're a woman and you do that, it's, uh, you know, a double-edged sword. That's yeah, right. it is, honey. Okay. You brought it up, and it was one going to be my first question. Sure. Okay. And um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you again, you sure you want to get into <laughs> this? I just want to make sure, you know, before I tell all these wonderful people how great you are. Okay. The state budget. Now, mm -hmm. let's start by being honest. Mm -hmm. Okay. The state in the past did not adequately fund all of their liabilities. Yeah, and 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 I've been very um, talking about being honest. I've been very honest about that. It was a Republican governor and a Democrat-controlled legislature that agreed to do that. But you know who gets left off the hook? Union leadership. And the reason I say that is because, for instance, when uh, Governor Rowland um, signed away that deal for uh, 20 years, the CBEC yep. agreement. He did so uh, negotiating with union leadership to lower the amount of funding that was heading to pensions. Um, we see that over and over again. So, you know, you can't just say one party is responsible. It's double. It is. It's and, double. And, and I've been very honest about talking about that. Um, it is a horrible place where we are right now. Um, on top of it, you have a retirement board, for instance, the teacher retirement board, uh, commonly referred to as TRB. TRB's uh, interest rate on the return on those investments was so overinflated, just recently they brought it down to 8%. Okay, wait a minute. Let's, for the, for the people out there that are sitting there uh, watching this and having a cup of coffee or, you know, something. Okay, what do you mean it was overinflated? You've so got to explain imagine, it in layman's terms okay. for me. So imagine you have a savings account. You have a savings account. And okay. you're, you know how they have those Christmas accounts, right? And you yeah. put money in it. So let's just imagine very basic terms. You have a savings account and you put money in that account and you are hoping for a huge return of on, maybe your money. on your money. Right. And let's say that return is 8%. Right. But the market is only really producing a 1% return. You plan your vacation based on an 8% 8%. return, not on the 1%, and then you still go on vacation. Okay. and then come home and find that you can't pay your bills. You can't. That's pretty much what has happened in the state because they were assuming this large return on their investment and until recently those investments were returning less than 1%. So you never can make up the money that you are planning on having there. So it's just basic, uh, basic math. And the TRB could have lowered that assumption rate. And the reason they didn't do that was because then it would have shown truly what our unfunded liabilities really are. It really was. And there's some people, it's about $81 uh, billion dollars on paper. There's a lot of people who believe if you had a realistic interest rate or a discount rate, it would actually be closer to a hundred billion. So it's big problems. It's a big, big problem. Right. Absolutely. Today, in fact, I just read this morning uh, before I came here that the debt per resident is one of the highest in the nation. It's at 53,000 per person. Per person. That's if, right. that, That's to bring us up out of this fiscal hole that we're in. Mm -hmm. Each one of us would have to reach into our pocket, give it to the state and say, here, clear up our debts. That's is right. that right? Okay, and I understand where we are in the hole, all right, um, but you mentioned the union. Now, I worked, when I w worked at CLMP, mm -hmm. I worked with the union, mm -hmm. okay? Good guys, mm -hmm. really good guys, the kind of guys that go out on the storm. The town of Cromwell, I worked with the union, and they were really the kind of people that, as a matter of fact, they're the kind of people that came to me when I was first selectman and said, Murdy, I know the town's in trouble because we have, you know, we have this debt. So here's our proposal. Mm -hmm. We're not going to take a raise this year. Mm -hmm. We've already talked to the boys. We're not taking a raise and we'll take two, two and two and a half. Mm -hmm. I was so impressed because they had come to me as the first selectman and said this the same way with the IBEW they did the same mm -hmm. thing I think 
the unions get a bad rap because of the higher echelon, well, not the little guy. Well, that's why I very specifically said union leadership. Right, um, right, and I, I agree with I, you it's, there. It's, I agree. Um, you know, I have, we all have friends that are hardworking, oh. whether they're in DOT or right. some other area of state government that are union members. I don't blame them for taking advantage of the uh, pr the plan that they have. Um, it was negotiated in good faith by uh, recently Governor Malloy, um, and I don't blame them for taking advantage of that. But I do put some blame on union leadership for I, not I really sharing the details of really what's going on. What's going on, because yeah. eventually those are the same ladies and gentlemen that are going to also have to bear the cost of getting us out of this hole. Yeah, and you know? you know, more importantly, they've been promised pensions yes. that, frankly, I'm very concerned are not going to be uh, able to be fully paid. And that's one of the things that, you know, when we talk about um, making sure we're prioritizing tax dollars, in our plan last year, we would have taken what's in the rainy day fund right now, which is over a billion dollars, and make it uh, climb much higher. And we took a substantial portion of that, and our proposal was to pay down the state employ employment retirement system and the teacher's re employment uh, retirement system, and then leave a third in the rainy day fund. And um, Democrat uh, friends on the other side said, absolutely not. Uh, we want that money to stay in the rainy day fund. So our proposal would have paid down significant, I mean hundreds of millions of dollars of this hundred funded pension liability, but more importantly, it would have saved us about $60 million a year in debt service every year That's, for that too. I'm so glad you went there because uh, I'm no gigantic mathematician, ask mm -hmm. my children, okay? <laughs> I, believe me, you know, the, my teachers all prayed when I left the math classes <laughs> but um, and said, thank you, God. All right, but what, when you talk about of the debt service and, and the way you just explained it. I need you to do it in layman's terms. You wanted to take some of the rainy day fund, mm -hmm. am I correct? Mm -hmm. And put it into the retirement fund. Am I doing this right? Into Please explain two, it to me. Into, so right now, because of, because of the tie in the Senate, uh, I was one of a handful of people that were, because I'm the ranking member of the Appropriations I Committee in that. the House. I forgot that was in there. That's okay. okay. Yep. So because of my role in the House, I am involved in the budget negotiations for my caucus. And so I was in the room when we were putting together those pieces. And one of the things I personally insisted on was doing something with the Rainy Day Fund. But the Rainy Day Fund balance is only there because Republicans were in the room. We put something in called a volatility cap okay. with Democrats support, mm -hmm. um, which said if we get any unanticipated revenue, one-time revenue, right. over a certain amount, that's going to be automatically deposited in the rainy day fund, which happened. And when it happened, we got a lot of money from repatriation of dollars overseas, the stock market, et cetera, et cetera. So we had all this new money coming in. Instead of it going into the general fund to be spent on new programs, we directed it into the rainy day fund. Technically, it's called the budget reserve fund. Um, and what I said last night at a forum I was at was, it's not just about um, you know who do you trust to make spending decisions um, out of the general fund, but who do you trust to spend over a billion dollars in the rainy day fund? And we have a record showing that we want to pay down debt. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I agree with you. Uh, you know, as I said, I did a lot of homework because you were coming to be my guest, and I'm going, this, this is mind-boggling how much of our tax money is going to just go and pay on debt, yeah. not even to, for services and things like that, but it's going to pay on this gigantic debt. And I said to myself, the average guy, like me out there, has no clue they don't. how much borrowing this state has done. I'll give you a, a really clear example. Uh, Governor Malloy, over the last eight years, doubled our bonding. It used to be, and this is a huge amount of money, it used to be about $1.8 billion a year went through bonding. He doubled that, and it's now up to $3.8 billion a year. What does that mean? That means he basically he's taken out the state credit card and swiped it through the machine, oh. double any other governor uh, in the uh, history of the state of Connecticut. That now has a high debt service or minimum credit card payment. Of course. That is due. Like any of ours. Exactly. 
And, exactly. you know, and that is, to me, frightening. Uh, and it's frightening not because of me, but because of the young people that yes. are coming up. And they are inheriting all of this debt unless we find some way to get out of it. They're, you know, and I don't want to see us losing all these young people saying, Connecticut, you don't know how to handle money, I'm out of here. Yeah. And so it's very important that people like you get out there and tell people we've, we've got, we're going to have to make some hard things. Yeah, we have to live within our means. Just like you and I do at home. That's right. We have to live within our means. One of the biggest problems we have in the state is how we actually do the budget process. And without getting bogged down into a lot of terms, I'll just say this. When you are in your household and you're about to spend money, you know exactly how much revenue you have coming in. Absolutely. You base your spending based on, on how that. much revenue you have. At the state capitol, we go through a budget process which prioritizes spending, and the revenue is done last. So what they that's, have... That's what, backwards. Backwards. So I what they do... with the money I got in my checking account, mm -hmm. look at it and say, okay, I can pay this much on this credit card, and I've got to pay my electric and my gas, and this and this and this. And then, you know, I have an idea of where I am, Whereas they're saying, okay, I'm going to do this and this and this and this, and then let the chips fall where they may. Uh, yeah, well, what they do is they say, okay, here's our spending priorities, and then they go to the Revenue Finance and Bond Commission and say, okay, this is how much revenue we need. So where do we get it? We borrow it. Or we raise taxes, which we've done the two highest uh, tax increases. Um, not the highest of all. I think there right. was a recent report showing that Weicker and others had the highest ever, but certainly in the top five in right. the last eight years. Okay. All right. So I hope everybody's staying with us because this is really, really interesting stuff because it impacts on the young, the old, the middle-aged, you know, it's, it's something that every one of us has to think about and deal with. Secondly, um, our economy in Connecticut is sluggish. There's mm -hmm. no getting around it. We've got people moving out mm -hmm. every day. We've got, um, you know, high tax burden. Mm -hmm. We've got this business now where the federal government says that you can only deduct $10,000 in state taxes mm -hmm. off of your income mm -hmm. tax, right? Mm -hmm. How do we, how do you, as a mother of young children, how do we get, and this blew my mind, the Economic Development uh, Commission just said that, oh, the numbers we gave you and everything were wrong, we're mm -hmm. so sorry, you know? Mm -hmm. And then I read down further and they, okay, audit themselves. That's like the fox telling us why he was in the chicken coop. Yeah. Well, luckily we have our state auditors who oh. stepped in and did a lot of auditing and that they're the ones who uncovered who the it. errors. That's, That's what right. I read. They but, caught it. But you know, I love this state. I, I love this district. We are very fortunate to live in the beautiful state of Connecticut. We have so many wonderful we do. assets. We I mean, do. We're sitting in a studio that's less than a half a mile from the ocean and Long yeah. Island Sound. And it's open to the public. Yeah. I mean, you know, we yeah. can, you and I can sit here and talk. Yeah. That's an but, asset. But, you know, but, but I've been telling people our state is sick. And we have to recognize that and deliver tough medicine. Whoever wins these elections on November 6th, um, if you see somebody who's so excited to go to Hartford with a big smile on their face and they're ready to go and they're like, yay, I'm going to go to Hartford, they probably don't know the significant gonna... issues that we're facing because I do it. Um, I feel the weight of what's going on in our in our state. Yes. I feel it on my shoulders. That's we... why I asked if you knew. Do you yeah. really want to do this? Yeah, yeah. I, think... I understand what. After doing my homework, yeah, I now I understand. We're not. It, nothing's going to be easy. We're going to make tough decisions. Um, you know, but frankly, the only way we can turn our state around and keep young people here is by bringing back confidence uh, in our decision making. And, and the, once businesses have confidence in the direction the state's going, they'll start investing. I think once you see that turning around and then, 
you know, the rising tide lifts, lifts all boats. Right. And I think it starts with confidence in the state of Connecticut. You know, four years ago when we started sounding the alarm in a significant way, our opponents on the other side said, oh, you just want to talk badly about the state. You guys are purposely doing that when we are just pointing out factual information. The only way you can fix it is by admitting what the problems are. That, that's absolutely, I agree with you 100%. You've got to look at it, you've got to say, you know, this is what's wrong, and what are we going to do, and can we work together to do it? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I feel so strongly about that. And we did in the budget. You know, the budget's not perfect. We still have out-year deficits. But, um, you know, the Republicans and Democrats sat around the table and did that. But I will say, our budget proposals, we did 10 of them on time. Our friends on the other side didn't finally do a balanced budget proposal until August, which is why we didn't have a budget until October. Which, it, it which was impacted, due in, yeah. Yeah, it was due in June. It, impact, it impacted small towns. Absolutely. Because they, like Cromwell, you know, we can't really make a decision till we know where we're, if we're going to get any revenue from the state or we're not, or how the education is going to be paid. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's a really, really tough kind of a Absolutely. thing to, to And to that's handle. what I mean about confidence. You have, if you can start uh, showing, and, and not with talk, with action, that you're going to have your ducks in a row, you're going to have a budget proposal on time, you're going to make the tough decisions, um, it's going to be short-term pain for long term gain, we have to provide confidence in the state again. I agree with you 100%. Now, I, as I said, I've been doing my homework, mm -hmm. okay, you know, I may not retrain it 20 minutes from now, but anyway, <laughs> I've been doing my homework, and we spend an awful lot of money on economic development, and yes. I honestly, from the numbers I read as I, you know, 10 o'clock at night going, are they out of their mind? Mm. This is, we're giving away all this money and we're get, not really getting a bang for our buck here. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the way the economic development in the state of Connecticut um, is handled, let's put it that way. Well, I've been asking tough questions all along of the commissioner of DECD, but I'll just um, talk about the first five program. Go, That's probably go. what you're, That's what you're exactly referring to. That's exactly what I'm to. referring to is so, the first five. Yeah, and it then became the first 10 and uh, on and on. We have given hundreds of millions of dollars of taxpayer money to companies to move 10 miles yep. or to um, the biggest hedge fund in the, in, the, in the world to build a helicopter pad or uh, I could go Wait a on minute, and back up. Build a <laughs> helicopter a, a, pad. Back in 2014, that was one of the proposals for bridge. I think it was Bridgewater specifically. And I mean, why would we? Oh, never mind. I yeah, don't want to know. it's just you know when you start looking at when you say the DECD uh, entered some false numbers. Those numbers that you were talking about were how many jobs were created by the investment. Yes. And they were way overinflated. And then on the flip side, we had given, and I say we uh, as uh, the state, I certainly didn't decide to do that. DECD, DECD commissioner gave X amount of dollars uh, to a company. And if they hired whatever their agreement was of people, they got to. Um, walk away. In, oh, other, in other words, they got a grant instead Jackson of a loan. Lab. A grant Jackson instead Lab. of a loan. Yes. So then when we did, okay, how much of an economic impact have we had in the state of Connecticut, they never included the number of companies that they gave grants to because you have to include that economic impact of okay. hundreds of millions of dollars that well, you sure lost. I, I want to repeat that number again, hundreds of millions of oh, dollars that did not millions. even, yeah. yeah. I, I'm reading this and I'm going, wait a minute, we spent all this money to bring three hundred jobs to Connecticut, 300 jobs and we're spending all of this money. Why didn't we just go out and find some nice little businesses in Connecticut and say, if you hire 10 and you hire 10 and you hire 10 and then we're going to make you, you know, mm -hmm. we're well, not talking millions. Yeah. Or I, I like to say, how about just lowering the tax 
burden right. for everyone. Again, the idea that a rising tide lifts all boats. We should not be picking winners and losers as a state government. Right. Of, you know, it should be, again, a, a policy that's fair for everyone. Um, one of the things we've talked a lot about is tourism, and it's a very important issue oh, in this yes. district. I mean, very, very critically important. So we have a couple line items in the budget. <coughs> One of them is for um, statewide marketing and then tourism. And when I went into the statewide marketing line item and started asking questions, I realized that we are spending a huge amount of money on a contract, not necessarily with TV time for statewide marketing. So we have to also be very sure that we're prioritizing the dollars, not putting it into a contract, but those Tourism yeah. uh, entities deserve TV time or newspaper print or whatever it is that we're going to promote them, right. not paying for uh, an executive salary. I was going to say, you are right on the money because we're not going to get a bang for our buck if we don't appeal to people. Yeah. And you're not going to appeal to somebody by giving some CEO $300,000 a year. Yeah. And I just picked that number out yeah. of the air, so I just <laughs> want to let you know that. So, okay. But I mean, I agree with you 100%. We could better prior prioritize our money, our economic development money, Absolutely. and do and tourism money and all that stuff if we didn't get, let the bureaucracy get in the way of it. And, yeah. you know, yeah. but anyway, that's my soapbox for okay. today, all right? <laughs> now, one of the things that's going to be of interest to most of the young people here, and me too, because I spent six years on the Board of Education in Grommel, is education. Mm -hmm. What kind of a hit? Now, I know 16% uh, of our new budget, I believe, is going to go towards uh, education. Did I get that number I right? Think so, I think so. It's, it's close yeah, enough. The yeah. Ed, the, so in the last budget, uh, we worked very hard to finally, once and for all, stop the politicizing of education dollars. That's something, uh, the acronym is uh, ECS. It stands for Education Cost Sharing Grants. Yes, yes, yes. And I always say, you know, there's no such thing as state money. This is taxpayer money coming back to communities. It's not like we're giving you a gift. You've sent millions of dollars to the state. Oh, let's do that one again. <laughs> it's not like we're giving you a gift. That's taxpayer money coming back for education. Yes, yes. I, mean, I like that. That makes my whole day. We yeah, can go home now. <laughs> there's no such thing as state money, and I remind people all the time of that. When I first got to the Capitol, I was appalled when I saw that the chair of the Appropriations Committee was able to write in the budget and give her community $3 million more and education cost sharing grants than anybody else. And I thought, what is going on? And to his credit, Senator Fasano, Len Fasano, who represents the shoreline in the New Haven area, uh, really sat down uh, two years ago and said, that we need to provide a, a formula that's fair for everybody. everybody. Yes. And we, I agree. we struggled, I'll be honest, even in the Republican caucus, we had a lot of people who were upset with the proposed sure. uh, proposal. Well, you're goring my ox. That's, that's right. But you need to have something fair. So we have a new ECS formula that was instituted last year. Um, it's a formula based on uh, the level of poverty, English as a second language, uh, your enrollment, all kinds of factors, but it's a formula. It's not based by, hey, your town gets X, so we're going to take yeah, Y. Right. And that was in response to the governor who wanted to do a couple things. One, he wanted to pass on the unfunded pension liability and the teacher's uh, retirement system onto communities at the cost of $400 million. And two, he actually zeroed out zeroed out the education dollars for 33 communities in Connecticut and basically was redistributing their tax dollars to other communities that I, he felt was more in need. I read that in the paper yeah. and I'm glad you jogged my memory because I remember saying, wait a minute, you know, who are you to take it away from Cromwell or Westbrook or, you know, anywhere and say here, I'm, I'm going to pick on poor little Hartford. Here, Hartford, you can have more money, yeah. okay? Uh, but Cromwell, you can't because you're living within your means. In Westbrook, you can't. In Madison, you can't. Yes. And when I read that, I, I was appalled. I said, yeah. what are they thinking? Yeah. I'm so glad that stopped. And they took it a step further. They also wanted to include the, the town's budget reserves 
and how they thought about those allocations. So again, to Senator Fasano's credit, he uh, really pushed an ECS formula. Um, and that was instituted with bipartisan support. And so now it's based on a, a number of factors. Will some communities get less than they got the year before? Yes, um, but I think it's around 5% less. Um, and it's really based on that formula. The problem that we have is that we have uh, declining enrollment in a number of our communities, yes, we do. and and that is a and that's a problem when it comes to um, the brick and mortar funding of their education system. Right, right. We have a lot of communities who are really facing tough choices, like closing schools, yeah. um, because they simply don't have the that's, students. They don't have the students. That's so, right. So having a formula that's based on metrics that's fair for everybody, and also focuses in on. Uh, our poorest students and those that need additional support, um, I think is a fair compromise. It's not perfect, but it's certainly better than what it was four years ago. And you know, you can justify it. Oh, absolutely. You, know, because you can it's, justify it. It's if a you, formula. If, if Murdy Terry comes up to you and says, why did my town get less money and so-and-so's town got more money, you can say those things to them, yes. that they have these kind of challenges that Cromwell doesn't have. Well, you know? and, and frankly, we don't, and we might not even have to get into that conversation. It's a formula. So you have a set formula um, based it, per student, yeah. and, and, and it's, it's across, across the, board. the board. So the formula is the same in Hartford, in Clinton, in East Haddam, and, and, and it doesn't matter. That's the formula. And so that's it. That's it. And, oh. and I think that's the fairest we could possibly be now. I like that. I like that. Okay. Now here's one of my favorite bugaboos. Okay. You ready for this I like one? that word, bugaboo. Yes. Well, I'm old. <laughs> okay. Regionalization. Yeah. That makes my hair stand on end. Mm -hmm. Anytime the state tells us, you must, thou shalt, thou wilt. Okay. I've looked at some of the regionalization where my mother-in-law lived, which was down in Middlebury. And um, the bigger towns drove all of the decisions. And here's little Middlebury. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting with my mother-in-law, bless her heart, and her saying to me, this is the worst thing that Middlebury ever did. Really, because we're getting nothing and the decisions are being made by the bigger towns. Mm -hmm. And that, that's only one side of the story. But you know what? It's here mm -hmm. in my mm -hmm. head. Mm -hmm. And I also have a problem with the state taking over and mandating more things. Mm. So talk to me about re regionalization. And I'm not putting you on the spot. I'm no, just, no, I'm just talking about my mother-in-law. Yeah, and, no, you know, no, no, no. You know, I think it's And I good. married her son, so I had to listen. <laughs> so, you know, the beauty we have in small towns, especially in the Connecticut River Valley, is there's a, there is already a lot of, not forced, but actually uh, they are entering into uh, partnerships uh, called shared yes. services. And you see that with a number of positions like the assessor or maybe a building inspector and other things. We should be encouraging um, in our statutes those continuing opportunities, but it shouldn't be forced, it should be enabling legislation. Right, in other right. words, if you choose to do this, then you have the opportunity to do so. Um, and, I, and there's a number of examples, but forcing regionalization, uh, I'm certainly not a fan of that. When I first entered the state capitol, we had a different speaker at the time. His name was Brendan Sharkey. And Brendan, uh, uh, Representative Sharkey, um, started something called the Moore Commission, which looked at regionalization efforts mm -hmm. statewide. And I, I attended those meetings early on and realized at one point, you know, it's really not the best use of my time because we are just talking in circles All constantly. The time. Right, right. Um, I have had other people talk to me about county government and how they wished we still had county government. Um, I've, I've tried to do a little bit of fact finding on that. I think again, we shouldn't be forcing them. We should be creating opportunities. So if they want to share yeah. services or a payloader right. or you know Whatever. equipment, right. they have the opportunity to do so. Portland and Cromwell share a senior bus. Yeah, well, and that's. that's cooperatively yes. made the decision made between the two towns, yes. which I thought was, that was terrific, yes. you know what I mean? But it wasn't the state saying to us, 
if you don't yeah. do this, we're going to take this money away from you. That makes my gray hair stand straight up yeah. on end. Yeah, and then the other thing you asked about was unfunded mandates, right. which for your viewers at home is a new law saying the town must do A, B, or C. And the perfect example of that uh, comes out of our education committee all the time, where we have uh, folks that are well-meaning, well-intentioned, yes. that say, you know, I want this to be taught in school. Schools. Well, we have a laundry list, of, as long as my arm, of things that we are saying to schools, you must teach, Jesus. not just this, but in this way. And, you know, I have voted consistently against those things, and it's not easy. I got beat up actually last night at a forum for voting against something that was an unfunded mandate to teach climate change a certain way, uh, way yeah. when we're already teaching it in our schools. I was say, and now we're keep your hands out of it. And That's now we're forcing them to go buy a certain curriculum. That's an unfunded mandate. And, and my, that's wrong. And it's wrong. Right. And, and again, I can think of so many well-intentioned things. Um, and the only one I did vote for last year was um, teaching about the Holocaust. I think in this yeah. state he, of, I, of... I was going to say, everybody should oh, know history. History. And we're missing out on a lot of history. Yeah. Now, the kids don't have any clue but, about some of the but things. That, but that was put forward with a list of thousands of free website material that somebody could go to teach. But we have to really just get tough and say, that's well-intentioned, but I just can't support an unfunded mandate. Right. I'm with all good. You and, you and I are, we're doing pretty good. All right. We're all gonna, right. I'm sure we're going to disagree on, on oh, them, some things. Okay. So. Let's do this one. <clears throat> you ready? Yeah. Tolls. <laughs> you knew that was coming. Yes. <clears throat> so. Believe me. Yeah. You are looking at a senior citizen who says, no tolls. Where did all the money go that we put into all these transportation budgets in the past? Mm -hmm. Why is nobody asking that question? Mm -hmm. Did it go into the general fund? And why? And you, maybe this is where I learned. My husband said to me when we were doing lottery, this money is all going into education. Ha, ha, ha. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And he laughed. He really did. He laughed right out loud. And now they're talking about putting tolls in to go to transportation and infra infrastructure. I can't even talk today. <clears throat> you know, and all these things. And I'm going, uh-uh, mm -hmm. no. Mm -hmm. it's, gonna, it's gonna grow from just truckers, which Rhode Island's now going to court because the truckers are saying, uh-uh, you're discriminating against us, mm -hmm. and that's uh, against the chamber or the commerce laws or something like that. I don't want us to go to court over that. What do you think about tolls? So I'm against the toll plan. That I love you. <laughs> Give me your hand. I want to touch you. Okay, go ahead. Um, against the plan that the DOT put out, um, it's not. It's not the kind of tolls like in New Hampshire or other places. The tolls that DOT started with were 72 locations throughout the state. I know. 72. Um, and I talked to, you know, whether it's seniors or small business owners or others, it is really unaffordable uh, for them to consider that. So on top of that, we have a lot of data already. And then, of course, the governor put forward his $10 million, $10 million toll study. study. Yeah. Which $10 is, million dollars to study tolls when yeah. most of the people in the state are jumping up and down and saying, no, let's yeah. look at other alternatives. And for the people who are saying yes, <coughs> what's interesting to me is that uh, the, the governor nominee, uh, governor uh, nominee uh, Ned Lamont, has been talking about how he would support the Rhode Island model. Yep. And he's been making statements that it would raise a hundred million dollars a year when the actual truth is Rhode Island's only raising about 20 would be raising about 24 million dollars a right. year but I go back to the bipartisan uh, budget agreement we started to um, incorporate the prioritized progress plan that the Republican caucus put forward what it would do is it would prioritize bonding dollars already in the general obligation bonds to say, okay, maybe we can't afford a splash pad like the governor just gave away to oh. New Haven or other things. Let's prioritize those dollars and, and dedicate them to transportation. We just did that. We invested another hundred. We have a hundred million dollars now in that program. And if, if the Democrats had only let us implement the full program, we would be able to prioritize existing 
revenue, existing dollars into transportation. Because like you do at home, if you walked into your home and you said, geez, my door's falling off and I have uh, flowers I want to plant in exactly. my garden. My door gets fixed. That's right. And that's not what we're doing in the state. We're saying, oh, we have all these problems and we have all these wants, not needs, yep, yep. and we're prioritizing our and wants first. Giving us wants. That's right. Yeah, I, it just blows my mind, some of these things. Yeah. I'm, glad you, I'm glad you explained that to me because I, I feel like it's just going to be another burden on the, the little guy, the taxpayer. I'll tell you what brought it to mind. I was at a meeting and some young lady, around your age, I'm going to say, mm -hmm. okay, was sitting there and she did this. She was sitting there and she was figuring these things out, just estimating. And she said to me, you know what, Mrs. Terry? And I went, what? She said, I'm on the road all the time. And with these tolls, it will cost me $220 a month, I'm estimating. And I'm a single mom. I'm a mm -hmm. widow. And she said, I can't afford that. I'll mm -hmm. have to take my children out of, out of Connecticut. Mm -hmm. And it made me sick. Yeah. I said, what? And, and don't forget, when they're talking about tolls, you know what they're not talking about at the same time is eliminating the gas tax. We pay the highest gas tax in the nation, 43 cents, cents. of every, every, yes, gas tax. So, you know, when they, pro when they proposed this, we had an amendment that would have eliminated the gas tax and all kinds of things. You, again, wants or needs. Exactly. Oh, mm -hmm. Melissa. You and I, you know, I'm old, you're young, but we're doing really, really well here, you know? Okay, so we are spending um, 10, 20, how many millions on this study? 10 million? Well, well the, the, hopefully the new legislature can um, stop that action. So, oh, good. Yeah. Oh, good. That, so nothing's good. been spent yet. Oh, nothing's been no. spent yet. It's all, they're, we're all out there talking yes. about it, right? Okay, well, that's good. Let's see. Okay, let me throw this one out there, which really... I have to be honest with you, I'm just throwing it out there because it, just to aggravate you guys out there, just, this is just an aggravation. Let's talk about the busway. <laughs> okay. I, I don't ride the busway. I don't go near the busway. So I'm just aggravating. So yeah. I'm just aggravating you people out there, they're subsidizing this. Go ahead. And they are subsidizing it by hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, my office looks out onto uh, near Capitol Avenue, and I see the green buses all the time, and they're all oh, empty. empty. Yes. Um, so it's very frustrating. In fact, one day, my friend, uh, one of my best friends at the Capitol, Senator Craig Miner, and I were taking a walk to go grab a coffee. And in that walk between the Capitol and uh, the coffee shop, there were four bus stops. So we see the bus go by empty. We see another one coming empty. So we went and stood at the bus stop and the gentleman opened the door and uh, we started asking questions, you know, how far are you going? You know, what's, what's your typical uh, bus uh, load? And, you know, very frustrating to see. Um, the problem, of course, now we have is that if we were to stop the bus route, because we obligated ourselves to the federal government, we would have to pay all that money back. And it's I mean, I'm not, I don't want to take, it's, it's got to be close to $500 million. Okay. All right. Now, being the devil's advocate, how much is it costing us per year to run it? Well, that's, that's really uh, one of the things that is uh, unknown. In the budget uh, documents, we have a one line item, one line item. It just says bus and rail operations. The real, the real issue is how they're counting passengers. Exactly. So let's just say you have a route that is uh, 10 miles long and it's from A to B. But, um, but then you have uh, another five miles, you have C. And this person's going to C. Does he count as one trip or two? He counts as two trips, according to DOT, because he <laughs> stopped. Because good. because <laughs> then they they have to stop at B two, and and that's the frustration because we don't feel like they're being um, really accurate. Yeah. I don't think they're purposely trying to oh, deceive. Oh, Melissa, I, I want to be a little, little gen door, well, be more I have gentle. This adorable bridge. I'd like to send you, <laughs> spell you. It's in New York State. But I, you know, <laughs> that's really. the frustration part. And don't forget too. They don't. It's it's the 
honor system. And so how much money are we really getting for it? And, and how much are we really spending? Yeah. And in the long run, if we paid the money back to the federal government, would we be better off? Because how many millions are we paying every year yeah. to subsidize something that's empty? Yeah. It's crazy. And you know, we just did it. Uh, version two is the Hartford to Springfield rail line. I'm going to be very interested when I head back, hopefully, oh, yeah. if I have the honor of representing the district, when I head back to Hartford, I'll be looking for numbers on that too. Excellent. I hope yeah. that you can do that because I feel it. All right. The last one I'm going to tickle you with, Sanctuary Cities. Oh, okay. Let's go. So, you know, I'm a, I don't think we should have any um, laws protecting people who are not uh, here legally. Um, having sanctuary cities is setting a precedent. I think that's... Um, yeah, we're thumbing our nose at the federal government. Yeah, we're, fed, we're not only are we doing that, we're, but, we're also, but we've also started with giving light driver's licenses to folks who are here undocumented. Welfare. Um, well, they claim that there's some money that they're not getting, but I still think that there's, uh, you know, oh, some yeah. dollars there. One of the controversial votes probably in the last session that I took was against giving undocumented students um, yeah, uh, to aid to, to, get to, money. Co to colleges. Yes, and you know what? And I, I read that, and I yeah. agreed with you, because my children worked, okay, to get the money, and they didn't get, you know, one of them got a scholarship, you know, but the other ones, you know, didn't get scholarships because we, my husband and I made just about what we needed to make so that we were not eligible for all this stuff. And yet, here you've got people that are turning around saying, okay, they came from another country, but we're going to give them free ride. I have to agree that I know I'm making myself unpopular, and I really don't care, but I agree with you 100%. Well, you know, what's frustrating, so I have, as I mentioned earlier, two, two uh, children. My daughter's already graduated college, but my son is um, a sophomore um, at a college. And for instance, uh, what a lot of people don't recognize is when you, if you are a parent right now that is sending your child to UConn, for instance, part of your tuition, within that tuition bill, there's something called the set-aside. And it's in statute that 15% of the tuition bill should be set aside for merit-based scholarships. That's the money that the undocumented students are looking to be able to tap into. But what's happened at UConn is they're actually setting aside 18%. 18% of your tuition. So when we hear that tuition is increasing, yeah, we're not I say to myself, picture. wait a minute, you're already setting aside 18% for, yeah. for people who most likely um, are not going to be able to avail themselves to it that are here legally in the state of Connecticut. That's right. And that's Born here, grown up here, and can't afford to go to You UConn. want them to be successful. You want those students to be successful. But here's the thing. You know, my son picked up soda cans yes. um, to help to help pay those things. He'll never be able to get any of that kind of assistance. And I think we again have to be sure we're being fair to everyone. I, I'm I'm with you 100. percent I, you and I, you know, charity begins at home. I you know I hate to say it, um, and it's not that I want to be mean or anything to anybody, but to the people that pay the taxes and they work hard and they, they raise their children and you know they support their, the businesses around here and they've done it for years and years and years. Why should their children be penalized? Mm -hmm. And why shouldn't they be given that helping hand? I, you and I agree 110%. And I just want to say we've already given them, uh, given those students, the undocumented uh, students, an opportunity for savings because they're getting in-state tuition. Yes. We're not charging them out of state right. tuition. We're so giving them in state tuition. We, yeah. So we are giving them, um, and I think that's fair. I think Again, so I too. think it's about fairness. Okay, we have probably three minutes, okay, I'm estimating. Okay. And, and I hope that after the election you'll come back and see me I again would love to. because I've got. Opioids, healthcare, XL Center, blah. I got oh, so much you got stuff, a lot of here stuff there that we're not going to be able to get to today. But what I'd like to do is give you one minute, okay? Only one minute, okay? okay? I'm because, looking at the clock. Okay, because mm -hmm. we're going to have to close this up. But I want you to take that minute to talk about what anything you want. Go ahead. Oh, 
well, that's that's a wide open thing. Yes. So you know, I would just Don't say talk about my weight <laughs> or mine either. <laughs> I would I would just say that you know the I've I've been running for the state senate since March. I've put 10,000 miles on my car visiting this be beautiful district. I mentioned earlier we've knocked on 10,000 doors. I've learned a lot, um, even more, um, about the district and myself. But the reality is I have the passion, uh, the commitment, and the dedication to this district. Uh, a full-time dedication to the job. I have a 100% voting record for, for six terms, uh, six uh, sessions at the Capitol, and I think I could do the best job on behalf of this Senate district. I'm uh, transparent, wide open, very accessible uh, to folks, and I hope that I can earn their support if they take some opportunity to learn more about me on my website, melissajebrin.com, social media, you can use the hashtag CTSenate33, and if your viewers have any questions for me, Again, um, uh, my door is wide open. I hope I hear from them. You're delightful. You are a delightful, delightful guest. I'm going to wrap it up now. Great. I'm going to thank you first for being here. And on behalf of Melissa, you notice I didn't try to do her <laughs> last name. You're on your own with that, all right, everybody? Um, on, behalf, on her behalf and my behalf, um, God bless our military men and women, um, our veterans, our first responders, and all of you out there that care about this state and this nation, I wish the best to all of you from both of us. Thank you and good night. <laughs>